there's a bunch of movie buffs among us who have at some point or another been caught up in the Marvel Universe. And it's come up with a flurry again with recent new movies coming out. If you've got the patience, you can trace the whole thing through the multitude of movies that have been made. And there have been graphics like this one to try to help us do it. Did you know the Marvel Universe starts in 1943 and works way forward? What a, what a full-on thing. I personally don't have time to watch that many movies. Some do. More power to you. I personally like to draw to just a couple of the contained stories. Um, just a few streams of thought. So I, uh, you know, look for me, my favourite out of the Marvel Universe, the most, the favourite, the funniest, I like humour, I like to laugh. So I get drawn to the Guardians of the Galaxy. So you got one over there and then you got a, you know, I'm also a wrestling fan so having Bat Dave Batista in that as well is really cool. So then you've got a few Guardians movies and there's a couple others in there that I kind of think, yeah, they're pretty cool. I like those in and of themselves. I pick and choose the bits I want to engage with in this universe. Spider-Man, weak. Sorry, come at me. <laughs> Iron Man, pretty cool. High tech, I like it. Captain America, the origin story is really cool. Thor, man, it's going woke. <laughs> Did I mention Gardens of the Galaxy? But anyway, <laughs> the writers of these films, and even the writers of the comics, Stan Lee and others, actually want you to be more invested than just those three or four movies. They want you to engage, not just with the individual character or the individual story, but the overall narrative that forms the Marvel Universe. It sells movies, but it also tells a large, intertwined, overlapping narrative. It's good movies to provide backstories, but these individual backstories then become forced to play with others in the narrative. And the narrative then overlaps with layers of complexity until it all culminates in one movie aptly titled End Game. As most of us are aware, we have been using these Sunday Times to explore the book of Revelation in a series titled Reveal. For those still struggling to take it all in, and, and let's face it, we all do at times, it might be helpful to consider this a bit like the Marvel Universe. You might even find it helpful to call it John's Revelation Universe. You might find it helpful to think of the letters to the seven churches as a contained space in this Revelation Universe. Other contained spaces and storylines and characters then follow. The interludes where the throne room of God and its workings are shown to us are both its story in and of itself, as well as a, and, but this story clearly overlaps into all factors, all other stories within this universe. The opening of the seven seals, the sounding of the seven trumpets, the pouring of the seven bowls of judgment are all seemingly contained stories. Chapters 12 to 14 and the idea of an unholy trinity can be seen as another. And yet they all overlap and intertwine with each other at the same time. And finally we get to the rise and fall of a system codenamed Babylon. The section that we're exploring now. They all stand in and of themselves as stories and vantage points which tell the story of humanity and history several times over. But they overlap, they work together. We've seen already that the book of Revelation is not a straight up linear story from go to woe. It has twists and turns and overlap and callback and all those things that make a dramatic presentation work well. It is good to remember that this is believed by many scholars to have actually been written like a production, a play, and that it was not just read out for the churches, but acted out amongst the seven churches. So it has 
drama and twists and plots and, and song and all these different things that make this thing a dramatic presentation. And we would do well to try to get caught up in the drama of this thing, not merely look at it as words on paper and try to analyse it with this staunch ways that we do it at times. It is a drama. Get caught up in it. But then the various twists and turns lead us to the last contained story. John's Revelation universe has an end game drama to explore at the end of its pages. And we're starting to get to that now. Peter and Marguerite have helped us explore the rise and fall of Babylon. To the early church, this is certainly a reference to Rome, for it is a place with seven hills, a geographic reality of that city. But it remains today as the humanistic systems of the world. Our Australian parliament is as, part, is as much part of Babylon as Rome was back in John's day. But Revelation 18 shows us that it is all going to fall. There will be lament because the shame of their humanism will be shown for the folly it is. There will be riches and power in this life for the evil and the godless. There will be diminishing mercy and justice. And ultimately, there will be nothing to show for their lives when chapter 19 comes around. After Babylon falls, the systems of the world come to their end. There will be a last hurrah and then true justice and judgment. And that's what we'll see in chapter 19. So we're going to look at that together today and explore a few brief thoughts today. Let's read from verse 1. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne and they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Imagine an angel having to tell you that. At his feet I fell to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Hold your thumb in your Bible, we'll come back. I wonder if you can imagine all those movies. Revelation's a drama, so the movie metaphor seems to work in this. Think of all those movies where the inner room of something like NASA is betrayed. Ever saw, can you think of some of those? Maybe you can even think of real footage like this. This is an actual photo of the NASA control room celebrating the first lunar landing. There's a whole heap of people gathered on the edge of their seat in these movies, like Armageddon and other movies that come out. They're waiting with bated breath 
as their long-term plans culminate with this one key moment. Imagine just seconds before the tension of that room as the rocket has gone up to the moon and everything is trying to land on this thing they've never tried to land on before and all this all new thing and they get this footage and then you get that one small step for man coming out and all of a sudden, jubilation! It worked! The biblical tense moment is the end of Babylon. The end of all sinful worldly systems. The end of martyrdom. The end of evil. The end of Satan's final charge. The heavenly V-Day. The complete victory of Jesus. And this passage shows us something really cool. When it happens exactly to plan, all of heaven celebrates. And amongst the celebration are a series of what are called Hallels. Not Halal, like an Islamic concept, but Hallels. Praises. This is the first half of the word, Hallelujah. Praise to the Lord. The Hallel in Scripture is actually found in Psalms 113 to 118. These were psalms of praise. Just read them. Praise the Lord, said time and time again. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Mentioned several times over. They are used extensively in Passover liturgy because they anticipate full relief from all slavery. The crescendo of those psalms is, in fact, the Hosanna cry that echoes as Christ makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. They continued to be used in ancient church practice around the Easter period. These heavenly shouts of hallelujah, these hallels, indicate that all has been fulfilled. All the slavery of sin is done with. Heaven is now able to wholeheartedly celebrate. And so too can the church. It's here in this eternal setting that the church is shown the true value of their faithfulness in this life now. In these verses, the difference between Babylon and the church is clear, big time. Babylon is a spiritually adulterous entity called a prostitute, by metaphor, for a reason. Deeply immoral, with no limits to her depravity. Highly idolatrous, with no desire to give credit to the God who made them leaning to self-deification, shedding innocent blood at every turn. The church, in contrast, is robed in linen to signify righteousness. She is presented in purity to Christ as a worthy bride. Of course, she is ready through grace, but there seems to be conscious work on behalf of the church here too. For she is said to have made herself ready. We are saved by grace, but we're empowered to do good works. The linen is linked with the righteous acts of the church. She was saved by grace for sure. But she did not sit idly by in life, but was active in the world even while Babylon did its thing. Luke 14 speaks directly into this moment that's being described, a 
Jewish leader speaks out, it speaks this, 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 this feast in the kingdom as a Jewish hope. And he's anticipating his own seat at that table. And Jesus speaks up and says that many will in fact be invited to this table. They'll be invited to this feast. And indeed it will be a wedding feast. And many will make every excuse under the sun to not be part of it. But here we're assured with a heavenly promise. The wedding is coming. The feast is coming. So as an invited bride, be ready and live in righteousness now. As long as we draw breath, choose righteousness. Then the chapter shifts gears a little. And we're going to read on now. We're showing, being shown another vision concerning the way the world's fall plays out. And it reads like this. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, the mighty, the horses, their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of the horse and all the birds gorged themselves in their flesh. John's love of the Old Testament prophets comes out in this section. He's borrowing lots of wording from the Old Testament prophets here. In Isaiah 11, the Messiah, the branch from the dormant stump of Jesse, is said to strike the nations with the rod of his mouth. In Psalm chapter 2, the great king will break or rule with iron. An iron scepter, as it's translated by John, a rod of iron in the, cha- in the psalm as we understand it. In Isaiah 63, a verse that anticipates this end time that has been written about here, the Lord is presented to us in red garments after trampling the nations in his holy wrath. Here, Jesus does all that. In every way, Jesus is shown to the persecuted, the downtrodden, the martyred church, that he is greater than all powers in heaven and earth. He is faithful and true when all earthly powers are liars and servants of self. Where there is injustice, Christ will put it right. He holds all authority, ten crowns on his head, indicating true power over the world. He is king over all kings, as we've sung today. He is Lord over all other lords. That word, Lord, there, 
was actually the title that Caesar wanted to be known as. And gave you a certificate for calling him that every year. If you would not do that, you would be refused different rights and privileges in the society you lived in. The world's anti-God forces are shown to be led out to a final showdown by the beast and the prophet. But it appears a battle doesn't even take place. Such is the power and authority of Christ in this instance. Without opposition, two-thirds of the unholy trinity are given the don't argue. Simply captured and thrown into hell. The victory over the dragon and his cronies was established long before this time. It was established at V-Day, at at D-Day. The cross, the resurrection, the ascension, all pointed to the victory of Christ over the dragon already. So this is presented to us here almost as if it was merely a formality. It's a foregone conclusion. That all these things that are erupting against the people of God today are going to fall to Jesus and be judged without incident, without an argument, without even raising their fist. Pfft, don't even try it. It's a given that their demise and their defeat is coming and indeed has already come. As for the dragon, his day's coming. We'll see that next. But at this juncture, I simply just want to stop and offer two reflections for us to consider as we read a chapter like this. They go like this. How are you going at being a bride in waiting? There are two parables by Jesus that you can consider in your own time. There's the parable of the waiting bride called to keep her, with the bridesmaids called to keep their, uh, their, their lamps burning. To light the way for when the time the groom comes. To be ready to be swept off the feet. To be part of the celebration when it all finally happens. To be diligent, to be watchful, to be awake, to be ready. To have oil in a lamp that will last the journey. parable of the wedding feast, which I just alluded to before. Jesus says many are going to be invited to this feast. And and, and so many are going to think of all the other earthly reasons why they can't be part of this. And the doors will close, the celebration will start, and anyone who changed their mind will go, and Jesus will have to say, I don't know who you are. Bye-bye. Are we being diligent? Are we keeping trimmed lamps and oil in abundance? Are we being faithful and exclusive? Morally, and even in the area of idolatry. Marriage is an exclusive union. At least as God designed it. So when Christ is presented using marriage terminology, he is calling for an exclusive union between us and he and his church. There is no space for us to let our eyes stray. There's a reason Babylon is called a prostitute. It is present, it's the world and its systems is a highly immoral way of life, something that is absolutely hostile to God. And it's a strong word in order to 
actually call the church to not partake in those things? Are we faithful and exclusive as brides in waiting for our king? And since we're invited to this, have you actually given the RSVP? Have you answered the invitation? Have you said in your heart, have you said it publicly and in accountable community and even to the Lord himself, yes, I will take your invitation. Yes, I accept what you have for me. I will, I will, take you, I, I will say yes to your righteousness. Yes to your white robes. Yes to the hope you give. Yes to your eternal offer. No to the world and its ways, the world, the flesh, the devil, all the things that I've been living in pursuit of is now nothing, and Jesus, you are everything. Yes, I will answer. Yes, I will answer exclusively to you, and I will be ready. Are we dressed in righteousness, friends? Anticipating this wedding feast. The other question is, have we made a clean break with Babylon? The grisly fall of that way, that system, is assured. But we're told the faithful believer has nothing to fear. Indeed, we will be the ones celebrating. If we love this life a little too much, we'll find ourselves caught up in adultery towards God. And that's not where we want to be when he comes. Is the world creeping in in ways that it has no business doing so? We have this tension. We're in the world. We have to play by its rules at times. But we are not of this world. We hold a, to a greater standard in this life than what the world knows. Because the ways of God's kingdom are greater than the ways of this world. We are called to a wonderful standard in him. Let us live the kingdom way, even though we don't in in inhabit it yet. Because we are already citizens of it. Let's cut ties. Let's make a clean break with the things of this world. And let's lean into the exclusive relationship between us and the, and the groom to come. Maybe these comments have challenged you, and I pray that to be the case. Let us leave them on screen for 30 seconds, and I'll let the Lord speak, and I'll close in prayer in one moment.